Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, I'm Peter Dodds from CSRO, and I'd like to thank you all for, for joining in this session and tuning in. And I'd like to thank the organisers for giving me a chance to share some of our work with you on identifying avirulence genes in the wheat stem rust fungus. So, of course, we're, we're interested in uh, avirulence genes because we're interested in how new virulent stem rust races can emerge and evolve. And there are a number of processes that are important for this one is sexual reassortment, which requires the presence of the alternate host. Asexual exchange is also an important process. And I think Melania Figueroa will talk some more later about the emergence of UG99 by somatic hybridization. And of course, the other common mechanism is the mutations that occur in, in clonal lineages that give rise to virulence. So the thing that's in common between all of these processes is they result in the generation of either new alleles or new combinations of alleles of avirulence genes. So what are avirulence genes? Well, in, in wheat rust, we have a gene-for-gene gene resistance mechanism where there are resistance genes in the host which encode for immune receptors, and they actually recognize the products of avirulence genes from the pathogen which are delivered into the host during infection. And the outcome of that is to trigger a defense response and often cell death, which leads to resistance. So of course, what we wanna do is identify what some of these avirulence gene products are and how they're recognized, what changes in those genes lead to virulence, and how can we track that, those changes and that variation in populations of stem rust. So a couple of years ago, we published on the first avirulence gene that we'd identified in, in wheat stem rust, which was AVRSR50. And this was identified by analysis of a, a mutant strain that was identified originally by Bob McIntosh at the University of Sydney. And in collaboration with Robert Park, we sequenced that isolate. And when we looked at the, the sequence of that, what we found in the end was that it actually resulted from the loss of a complete chromosome, it's chromosome 14B uh, from one of the two nuclei. And that carries the avirulence for SR50. And the other chromosome carries the virulence allele. Uh, so we were able to identify the avirulence gene by just taking all of the candidate effector proteins from chromosome 14 and testing them for recognition by SR50. And we do this in a tobacco system where if you co-express a resistance in the avirulence protein, it triggers cell death. So here you can see that SR50 and AVR SR50 results in cell death, whereas SR33, which is a different resistance gene, can't recognize AVR SR50 and you don't get cell death. We could also show that function in wheat using a, a viral expression assay, which is done by uh, Kosti Kanyuka at Rothamsted. And so he can engineer this barley stripe mosaic virus to express AVR SR50. And what we observed there is that if you take the virus that expresses AVR SR50, which is this one here, then it's just not able to infect a wheat line that carries the SR50 resistance gene. So it expresses avirulence in a virus. So what we're interested in is what, what's the variation, what are the nature of avirulence and virulence alleles here? So it turned out in the, the strain that we were looking at, it was heterozygous for avirulence. It contained one avirulence allele, which we call A1, and at the alternate allele, it had an insertion in the middle of that gene, which disrupts it, and we call that the A2 allele with an insertion in it, so A2 insertion. And when we looked at some other strains, uh, well, we found some different variants. So this is a, a strain from North America with pathotype RKQQC. Uh, it contains the same avirulence allele, A1, but another allele which is a, similar in sequence but has some differences. And so we couldn't predict whether that was actually going to be a virulence or an avirulence allele. Uh, and then another isolate, uh, QCMJC, which is actually virulent on SR50, contains one copy of this insertion allele, which is a virulence allele, and then another variant, which is a different amino acid sequence. And again, we couldn't predict from the sequence, although we, we predicted that it should be virulence allele because this is a virulent isolate. But we could test those, those two variants, C and, and D6, uh, by co-expression with SR50. And what you can see here is that the A1 and the C alleles are both recognized by SR50, so they're A virulence alleles, and this B6 allele is not recognized. So that is really a virulence allele. So what we're interested in is what was the, the nature of those amino acid changes in those different variants and how did they control recognition? And so what you can see here is the, the sequence of those three isolates and in, in red are the, the amino acid variants that are actually unique to the virulence allele and could therefore be controlling virulence. So we actually tested each one of those mutations uh, by incorporating it into the A virulence allele. And it turns out that just one of them is actually the, the single variant that controls recognition. 
So you can see here that all of these variants are still recognized by SR50, but this single change of a Q at position 121 to a K results in loss of recognition. And we could do the inverse by taking the, the virulence allele and making the, the inverse changes. And if we revert that uh, position back to the wild type allele, then we get back recognition. So that's the critical residue that determines whether or not these proteins are recognized. Now, we also looked at, at variation in, in a broader sense uh, because uh, Diane Saunders had actually published a, a set of sequences from a variety of, of rust isolates from around the world. Uh, and these include a number of isolates from South Africa and Australia, which are all part of this RACE21 lineage, uh, some representatives of the UD99 group, and also some representatives, including UK isolate, which are part of the, the Digaloo race group. And when we uh, mined the sequence that uh, Diane had produced for all of these isolates, we were actually able to identify 14 different allelic variants of AVRS or 50. And a few of those we'd already tested, so we knew whether they were avirulence or virulence alleles, A1 and B6, for instance. But then the others, we really couldn't necessarily predict whether they're going to be virulence or avirulence alleles. So we just, we made them all and we tested them by um, co-expression with SR50. And so it turned out that there were actually 10 avirulence alleles there and four virulence alleles. And they were of different types. So there's one, the insertion allele, which I already mentioned. There's this B6 allele, which has that one particular amino acid change. There's another allele D, which has amino acid differences uh, that result in loss of recognition. And then this A5 allele, which is actually identical in sequence to A2, which is an avirulence allele, but it's lost a stop codon. So it ends up adding an extra port portion of protein to the end of the protein, and that results in loss of recognition too. So there's a variety of different virulence mutations that can occur within the one avirulence gene. And one thing we could also do with this was go back to those uh, races where we derive those sequences and assign their genotypes. Uh, so a number of them are, are homozygous for avirulence alleles, but there are also quite a few that are heterozygous for avirulence and for virulence alleles, which includes UG99 and the Digaloo group. And so, of course, that's a concern for the potential for mutation to virulence just through a, a single mutation in those isolates. So more recently, we've actually identified another avirulence gene. This is AVRS27. Again, we did this uh, through analysis of mutants. We generated three mutants in the lab that were virulent to SR27. And when we sequenced those, we found that they all contained deletions on chromosome 2B in this region of the, the chromosome. And you can see that with the loss of coverage from, from sequence reads. Uh, and the smallest of those was 196 kilobases. And in that region, there are actually 50 genes that are annotated. So we looked then at a series of uh, field isolates uh, derived from South Africa and Australia, part of this RACE21 group. And there'd actually been three independent mutations to virulence on SR27 in these, in these isolates. And all of the virulent isolates contained independent deletions which narrowed that down to just two candidate genes, which are right next to each other. So it turns out there, there are two copies of this avirulence gene in the, at the avirulence allele on chromosome 2b, and they're closely related, but not, not identical. And then a single copy on the virulence allele, which again, it has a different amino acid sequence. However, in this case, when we tested the recognition of those, those proteins, it turned out that all three of them are actually recognized by SR27. So this is the results from that viral expression assay that I talked about before from Kostya Kanyuka. Uh, and it turned out that the virus expressing any one of those three variants is unable to infect a variety of triticale, which contains SR27. So this was unexpected because the virulence allele we expect not to be recognized. But in fact, the protein that's encoded by that gene is recognized. And, and the reason it's a virulence allele is because that, that gene is not actually expressed in the rust. So we can show that by looking at expression of those genes using RT-PCR. And so in the, in the wild type rust, which contains both alleles, we see expression of AVRS of 27, but in the virulence mutant, which has lost the, which still retains the virulence allele, uh, then we don't see expression. So that allele is actually not expressed and that's why it's a virulence allele. So just in, in summary, there, there are now three genes that have been identified in PGT, AVRS of 27, AVRS of 35 from uh, Edward Arkhanov's group and AVRS of 50. 
Uh, there's a variety of different mechanisms that can give rise to virulence alleles. You can get insertions and deletions, and the, the effects of those tend to be pretty obvious. Uh, there, there are amino acid changes where you really can't necessarily predict whether it's going to be a virulence or avirulence allele until you test it. And then we're also seeing the evidence for expression polymorphism that can result in, in virulence allele as well, which really complicates how you go about predicting the, whether it's a virulence or an avirulence allele. And obviously the overall goal in the future is to integrate this information into molecular diagnostic tools, such as the MARPLE tool that Diane Saunders has been working with. And of course, that's going to require knowledge of additional AVR genes and all of the allelic variation in those genes. And of course, the phenotypes that are associated with those variants. So I'd like to, to end there. I just want to thank a few people who've been involved in this, in particular Narayan and Rowat, who did all the AVRS27 and SO27 work. Uh, and Diana and, and Jean Chen, who, who did the uh, AVRS50 analysis. And also our collaborators at Rothamsted and University of Minnesota in Sydney, Robert Park, Brian Stephenson, and especially Costa Kenyuka at Rothamsted, who uh, did all of the viral overexpression assays. So thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to um, engage with you in the discussion a little bit later. <laughs>